Hello, hello. I am Ben Pick, and thank you for joining me in a Running to Write, where I give questionable writing advice through running metaphors. In honor of Black History Month, I'll be reviewing my latest read, El Penelope's Song of Blood and Stone, which is the first in her Ursinger Chronicles series. I do want to make sure that the cover comes in clearly, as it is beautiful, and I will be discussing it in depth during this review. There are trigger warnings for this novel for its extreme racism, acts of violence, and sexual relations, of which include assault. This is by no means a kid's book. I'm going to start this review with a slight tangent. A lot of restaurants in my area have closed due to COVID, and unfortunately, my local bookstore was also hit hard and has since closed. It was a wonderful nook, and I found plenty of secondhand gems within its walls. But sadly, it's no more. A month or two ago, I mentioned when I did the philosophy of reading tag, how I was hesitant to pick up a book off the shelf. I tend to rely on recommendations, and my TBR list is way too long to have a desire to go pick up a new book. Then I happened to be at the National Harbor for a video game conference called MAGFest, and I discovered that there was a local bookstore there called Mahogany Books. I am so glad that I found this place because I picked up a book based solely on its cover for the first time in years. I struck up a conversation with the two people who worked there and they were extremely knowledgeable and helpful. Suffice to say that I now have a lot more additions to my TBR list. If you're in the DC area, specifically Anacostia or the National Harbor, you should do yourself a favor and check out one of Mahogany Books locations. They specialize and want to help people find best-selling and classic African-American authors and stories, and I am thoroughly glad that I found a new go-to for a brick-and-mortar bookstore. Getting back to Song of Blood and Stone, this was Time Magazine's best fantasy novel of 2018, as well as one of their top 100 best fantasy stories of all time. I am disappointed in myself that I didn't discover this book until I found it on the shelf. Right off the bat, the story dropped me into its rich world with a short prologue. The prologue wasn't some action-filled assassination or a great leader standing at the height of their power the night before the nation falls into ruin. This prologue brought us into the story quick with a short summary of its ancient lore. Basically, two extremely powerful people crossed over into the realm of the story. Their children then intermarried with the people who were already there. The prologue then ends with a statement amounting to, everything was good, then it wasn't. I'm not opposed to prologues on principle, and Song of Blood and Stone's prologue did a great job of investing me in the questions it asked. This wasn't a prologue where it mentions some random character who doesn't come back into relevance until three-fourths of the way through the story, or that one aha moment. Side note, I don't usually like epic fantasy stories which use that storytelling trick. I think there should continue to be a debate about whether or not a prologue is needed for an epic fantasy story in order to set the mood. Song of Blood and Stone, though, pulled it off, primarily by being brief at less than two pages long. Then the strong opening continues with the first chapter. I was promptly pulled into the life of the main character named Yasminda and the world which hates her. Even the seemingly well-mannered constable spoke to her in a condescending tone as he reminded her to be a good citizen and stay out of trouble. Early in the novel, we understand without being explicitly told that the country Yasminda lives in, Alcira, is at war with the country to the east called Lagrimar. The Elsirans are robust with technology and resources, whereas the Lagrimars have powerful magic. These two countries are separated by a mountain range and a magic barrier. Whenever the barrier goes down, those from Lagrimar invade Elsira. That is a major source of the conflict and mistrust and hatred between these two people. Like the opposing countries, the two main characters, Yasminda and Jack, are largely opposites. Yasminda is of mixed race, with one of each of her parents from each of the countries currently at war. She happens to look like one of the Lagrimar citizens, and that brings up a lot of mistrust and hatred and racism against her, along with derogatory terms and mistreatment. 
even though she is an Alciran citizen. Meanwhile, Jack is an Alciran who infiltrated Lagrimar as a spy. He has since snuck back through the magical barrier, carrying vital information, though he's being hunted by a group of soldiers from Lagrimar. He was injured in escaping, and that's how he has me to find him at the end of Chapter 1. Together, they need to stop the magical barrier from failing, and none of this is really a spoiler, as this is all in the back cover. For world building, there is a lot of mistrust and hatred between the two warring nations, and those in Elsyra fear those from Lagrimar, namely because they're able to use magic. Without magic, the Alcyrans have advanced their technology up to about the 1900s, so they have electricity, they have automobiles, and they have guns, but they also still use horses in combat, primarily because the cars aren't that mobile. As Elsira and Lagrimar have been at war for centuries, those in Elsira hate anyone who looks like they're from Lagrimar. This means that Yasmina faces extreme prejudice, roadblocks, and derogatory terms across the story, even though, again, she is officially, legally, an Elsiren citizen. This hatred and prejudice frequently boils over as the Lagrimar refugees suffer at the hands of the Elsiren military, often coming to physical, violent blows. In addition, Elsira has strained relations with a third neutral country to the point where any of those citizens living in Elsira are required to carry around a green card and are limited to only live within a quarantined zone of the capital by the ports. Though this is a fantasy world, the unfair treatment of refugees fleeing poverty or worse in their home country feels oddly aligned with our own world and everything that's come to pass since this novel's been published. The setting felt very much like the 20th century as well as the 19th, where the capital city in Elsira has electricity, cars, and a lot of other more modern conveniences, whereas the borderlands where Yasminda lived didn't have power or running water. The way the different rotating narrators experienced the world made me think there was almost a hundred year gap between when they lived. I appreciate that realism as technology isn't uniform, so it makes sense that there would be an extreme difference between the capital city with its electricity and resources and the borderlands without. I can't remember which author tuber it was, but somebody made a bad trope video and they included deathbed promises there. That's the case for the C plot, in which Ella makes a promise to her dying sister that she won't let her sister's newborn child fall into the hands of her sister's religious leader. Not only is Ella's relationship with her sister already strained, where they haven't really been in contact for years and she doesn't understand the woman who her sister is, but Ella has very little reason to act on the promise she made or understand its full context. This leads Ella on a series of tenuous breadcrumbs stretching the realms of reasonable logic as she tracks down her new nephew. Each of the hints carry her through to the next clue in what feels like an inconceivable logical step, also that she can thwart a religious leader who, at the beginning, she didn't know was corrupt. Her desires never felt like they aligned with her actions, especially when she starts putting her life on the line. Throughout the story, she might as well be Longshot from the X-Men, who gains luck powers based on how benevolent he is. I'll go more into the details during the small spoiler section at the end, but... Some of the hoops Ella manages to jump through are ridiculous. That being said, her chapters are used to bring certain characters together and flush out the world that Yasmina and Jack are venturing in, so it's entirely forgivable. My other nitpick complaint is that a lot of the names and locations sound similar. When they're thrown out quickly, it can be very confusing as to where a person is from or where they're going, as well as who's talking and why they're acting a certain way. There's also a large cast of characters, many of whom have minimal impacts, while others come back with a huge amount of flair. This means that I often forgot who a person was, so the emotional beats didn't hit quite as high as they could have, as I was trying to recall when we last saw this person, and what they were doing, or where they're going, or why they're acting a certain way. Enough on the negatives, the prose is well written. The action is engaging and vivid, and even in these slower sections, there is more than enough tension to keep me turning pages. There isn't an abundance of purple prose, nor is the text simple. 
it conveys what it wants and needs to without adding in unnecessary excess. El Penelope respects her audience and lets some of the specific details be created by the reader. For example, there are two magic systems explored across this novel which aren't absolutely defined. This means that my version of Earth singing will differ in terms of the looks and sounds from what a different reader imagines in their head. There is more than enough to describe how it feels and the end results, but I appreciated this confidence in the reader's intelligence. Too many books handhold and do the work for us, draining the fun and imagination from the reading experience. I did want to include a spoiler section, but if you haven't read the book, please do yourself the favor of pausing this video, reading the book, and then coming back here. Or skipping ahead to the timestamp I've listed, so that way you get a much cleaner read. This is the timestamp to skip to if you don't want to spoil any of the story. Spoilers begin now. I'll start with something that's only a mild spoiler, as I'll be vague. The last newspaper article within the story's canon conveys a compelling and fundamental truth. I genuinely hope that anyone who reads this novel takes the message to heart and tries to understand that there are two sides in a conflict and people are often misled, largely due to misinformation. Moving on, here's one of the examples of Ella being a part of an extreme coincidence to further her story. She happens upon a bar based on a rumor and talks to the one stranger who's there. He happens to have overheard a conversation from at least a week prior, which he remembers in full. And this includes a specific sentence, which was spoken in a language he didn't understand. Not only that, but that language is region specific and one which Ella happens to know. That feels like a lot of coincidences lining up to get her to the next breadcrumb. This thread didn't feel like it had much of an impact on the story being told and was more for setting up events in book two. I'm not opposed to planting seeds for future plot points, but this felt extraneous and odd, especially given how streamlined the Yasmina and Jack sections are. This isn't something that I'm largely holding against the novel, as the tension in the Ella sections kept me wanting to learn more. However, it did break some of the immersion to think about the negligible likelihood of the continually occurring coincidences. The last spoiler point I want to make is that the ending alone made this worth the read. I was surprised where and how certain pieces of that resolution concluded. That's not to say there is a major twist, but the way in which they handled the saviors in the story is different than how most fantasy stories choose to end. Normally when the prophesied savior being worshiped appears in the story, they're there to end the climax with as little bloodshed as possible and then ascend or disappear entirely. Not here. The prophesized savior seems to be sticking around within the confines of the world and I'm sure they'll be playing a major role in the future books of the series. Keeping their savior in the world is an interesting twist on this typical cliche and will bring me back to read more in the future novels. That's the end of the spoiler section, so here are my closing thoughts. Overall, I'll give the plot a 4 out of 5. The main story is simple but captivating. I do think that the C plot drags down the story and does more to set up the future than help what's being told here. Other than that, the plot sink its hooks in me from page 1. I give the saying a 5 out of 5. The unique and enrapturing world building was created piece by piece without info dumps. I cared about the people, the cultures, the multi-side conflicts, all of it. The characters are a 4 out of 5. Yasmina and Jack had clear wants and desires, and I felt for their struggles. The side characters were far more than one-dimensional throwaways, and they made the world feel much more realized. My one issue is with Ella, who was far too naive and exceptionally lucky. More often than not, she seemed like a tool to carry the plot forward between the Jack and Yasmina chapters, or a way to expand the setting and world. Lastly, I'll rate the cover. The whole theme of this novel was to not judge a book by its cover, but this was captivating. You have Yasmina over here with her jacket billowing in the wind. That implies movement, change, and swift action, all of which came to fruition across the story. Then you have the soldiers towards the bottom. You have soldiers with guns, soldiers with guns on horseback, and automobiles in the background. 
that put me in the mindset of the early 19th century and instantly conveyed when this story takes place. Yeah, that's all good so far, but nothing to really set it apart from other fantasy stories. Then you flip it over and there are these foreboding pale eyes. To me, this seems like some all-powerful, all-seeing being who, since it's on the back, is in direct opposition to Yasmina on the front. That's the visual story I interpreted from this cover, and it's up to you all to read it and find out if that's truly what happens in the story. None of that matters though, because the sole purpose of a cover is to get me to pick it up and to read the back and then to read it cover to cover. To that end, it absolutely succeeded and I'm giving this cover a five out of five rating. My total rating for El Penelope's Song of Blood and Stone is five out of five stars. This is the type of novel to easily lose hours at a time in while reading. I am Ben Pick and thank you for joining me in Running to Write. If you enjoy what I do here, then please give me your own five-star rating by pressing those like and subscribe buttons. Let me know in the comments if you've read Song of Blood and Stone and whether or not you liked it. Do you agree with my opinions or is everything I said wrong? I post my running and writing progress on Instagram and Twitter as running to write. So be sure to follow me and join in with your own thoughts. See you next time. Until then, celebrate El Penelope's fantastic work by picking up Song of Blood and Stone.